So I'll, I'll put donors. Hello, Libertarians. My name is Dan Fishman. I want to welcome you to our episode of Libertarian Party Television Town Hall. I'm on here with Alex Merced. Alex, can you hear me? I think Alex is having a little bit of lag right now. Uh, I'm going to fill in until uh, Alex gets his connection on, but I'm going to leave you in the room, Alex. So please feel free to jump in with questions and stuff like that. We're talking about the supply chain tonight, which is really one of the... Uh, Miracles of modern organization of mankind. Uh, and we're lucky to have with us an expert in the field. I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. George Zedition. Dr. Zedition, thank you very much for being here. Oh, Mr. Fishman, it's my absolute pleasure to uh, be here and to uh, join in this uh, discussion today. Thank you. So first of all, let's have some definition for people who don't really understand what we mean by the modern supply chain. People think, oh, I go to the store, there's always stuff there. They don't understand what's actually behind that. So can you talk to us about that? Oh, heavens, uh, Mr. Fishman. I always think about the devil is in the details, and you're <laughs> absolutely right with that uh, statement. So uh, when we think about supply chain management, they actually the term just came about in the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, but very often we think about it with regard to manufacturing processes, uh, purchasing processes, uh, logistics, transportation, mm -hmm. and it really involves the uh, flows of goods, information, uh, as well as finances among organizations to eventually meet an end consumer, basically you and I and all us fellow libertarians, all the needs that we need and that we have in society. So it's really studying all those processes and those flows to get those products, you know, that we need to eat, to uh be able to uh, put clothing on our bodies, be able to shelter ourselves, and the whole myriad of uh, different products and services. So, you know, it's fascinating because I think a, a lot of Americans especially take it for granted that at any time of the year, we can buy strawberries, blueberries, pineapples, uh, almost any rare thing that you want can be found. But, I mean, this is a relatively amazing time for the supply chain, right? It's never been like this before. Absolutely. It's, um, and you know, there's a couple of things that have influence for us to be able to have these uh, integrated supply chains uh, today uh, to include the information systems that we have uh, among organizations to be able to communicate needs and requirements in a real time. In the uh, mid 1950s, they came with the idea of containerization and to be able to really help facilitate global trade. And uh, Mr. Fishman, one of the things I kind of appreciate of what you mentioned is that you could obtain almost any product or service almost any time that you want. And it's because of that global focus uh, that exists and really that integration among uh, companies worldwide uh, that really helps create those efficiencies uh, and to be able to provide those products and services that we all need. So it's interesting to talk about that because, you know, one of the, the words that people sometimes use is sort of a demonization word is globalization. But when we talk about globalization and the supply chain, it actually is, it, the world is much wealthier because of the fact that we are able to uh, have a modern supply chain that ships from America to China, the things that they need and vice versa. But that's also relatively new, right? That hasn't been, we haven't always had, or maybe we have. Maybe the supply chain is much older than I realize. 
Oh, goodness. Um, one of the first things I like to tell the students is uh, back in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, mm -hmm. why did he uh, sell the ocean blue? Is to be able to find that uh, spice, uh, be able to find the trading routes uh, through India. So, uh, and of course, Spain wants to be able to capitalize on this. So uh, supply chain management uh, as an activity really deals with the logistics and flows of products. And this has occurred through millennia. It's just the uh, shift that has occurred most recently is dealing with the information systems, the integration, uh, as well as a lot of the resources and the technologies that are available in the ports that we have and the ships. Um, so it's, it's really focused and we've seen a massive shift that has occurred in the past two decades. And in some ways, it's, it's sad, but also fortuitous at the same time. Not many people were discussing supply chain management until we started seeing COVID-19 pandemic manifest and some of the challenges that we have seen in trying to uh, manage our supply chains today. Uh, it seems to be almost every day that there's a, a news report associated with uh, supply chain management with disruptions, challenges uh, that occur. And this was not necessarily part of the lexicon of uh, normal discourse in the past. So, uh, you know, that leads us to a perfect lead in talk about the challenges in the supply chain during the COVID era. You know, almost everybody's seen either shortages of paper goods or, you know, there's shortages of meat. Uh, on the other hand, there are aisles and aisles of hamburger helper uh, that seems like a breakdown in the supply chain. Uh, what, what sort of challenges have we seen during this crisis? Oh, goodness. Um, well, there's been, I think, several uh, challenges. Uh, one of them is that supply chains cannot function without human beings. I know there's been, you know, a lot of new advances have been occurring with what's called the blackout warehouses, where you have more of the automation. But it's humans that make these final decisions. It's uh, the human beings that actually are part of the production processes themselves. Uh, I'm actually very much forward to uh, look, uh, listening to uh, Mr. Toller and Mr. Uh, Ryan Smith speak later. In my opinion, these are the individuals who are the true heroes that are helping us overcome uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Those supply chain professionals that have been going above and beyond uh, their normal call to be able to ensure that we have those uh, products that we need. And really the biggest, one of the challenges that we've seen is that there has been a huge shift in demand patterns uh, with different supply chain distribution channels. So uh, the first example that uh, comes to my mind deals with food uh, distribution itself. So if you think about it, for we've been so used to being able to go to a restaurant, for example, and enjoy uh, the ambiance and a, uh, having a good meal. And uh, for us now, in the last three months, to be able to have a uh, to go to a restaurant, it usually consists of calling ahead of time, and they change their entire production processes to be able to fulfill those customer needs. But there's been fewer people uh, going to those types of establishments, so those demand patterns have shot, gone down. While we've seen other demand patterns, such as for certain food types uh, in the grocery stores, as there's actually been uh, more of a demand for those products. Going back to the human resource uh, issue, one of the things that you mentioned was associated with the meat and the meat products. It wasn't necessarily that there was not enough uh, pigs or cows that were being uh, produced. The issue became associated with the uh, killing plants uh, themselves, and that became the bottleneck, and that was because of the human resource uh, issues when you have uh, employees that are not able to go to work to be able to process the um, uh, products, as well as trying to minimize any chance of contamination uh, as well. This is where we started seeing some of the uh, bottlenecks. So I think there's times we've seen with this pandemic that it's really disrupted some supply chains, uh, like in the automotive industry, where you've seen almost complete shutdown of uh, demand, while other supply chains, you've seen a huge increase in uh, demand, such as for PPE, you know, for the personal uh, equipment, the necessary protective equipment uh, for the employees. And as you had mentioned, for example, the uh, you know, the hand sanitizers, the uh, paper towels. Uh, so for some of the supply chains, especially those that are more inventoriable, uh, I don't think they have been affected quite 
as much. Uh, but then even some of the inventoryable items, such as the uh, toilet paper, there was a massive uh, surge in demand. Uh, many people, you know, started to basically shifted the inventory of where that uh, was of the toilet paper from the retailers to the uh, consumers themselves. So I'm sure there's still some uh, people out there that must have two, three months worth of uh, toilet paper uh, on hand right now. So it's really affected many different supply chains in such a variety of ways. And we're still learning about this today. So uh, we have an interesting question coming in from uh, one of the uh, one of our watchers saying, how much does uh, a a contagious virus like uh, COVID, does that impact a supply chain at all? Is there a uh, are some people is the supply chain affected because people are worried about the fact that paper goods or something else might actually be spreading or, in fact, <clears throat> do people have an urge to isolate a little bit more? And is that hurting us at all? Have we seen any of that during this cycle? Well, I would say that we saw a little bit of the uh, hoarding uh, behavior that occurred. And that's, I think, a natural uh, phenomenon uh, that occurs. But I have to say, uh, overall, I thought it would have a much more detrimental impact on supply chains today than it actually has uh, overall. And I'm going to also say that I don't think the government has really helped uh, very much in this process. I would uh, make the argument that it's really been the companies and the uh, supply chain professionals who have really uh, stepped up to the plate to overcome these challenges. In the end, the companies want to be able to meet their customer requirements. They want to be able to help the consumer because they want future cash flows that occur. And ensuring that we have a robust supply chain is something that's become an absolute necessity uh, to be able to facilitate that. That's a really great point because talking about the way that you know the companies are really stepping up, uh, it's been suggested that uh, a lot of what's happening now is because in many ways, the government has sort of stepped aside and stepped out of the way during this crisis to allow people to deliver things better. Uh, for example, I know they uh, they rolled back the rules on how long truck drivers could drive, um, other things like that. What are the things that you've seen in which uh, government has sort of stepped out of the way to try to improve the supply chain right now in the United States? <sighs> I wouldn't say necessarily stepping uh, out of the way itself. I would actually would make almost the uh, opposite argument that I've seen a couple of certain uh, activities that have actually created more uh, challenges uh, than anything else. Uh, I'll give you, for example, uh, uh, a good uh, colleague of mine. His name is Kevin Canfield. He is a, a small contractor, you know, develops homes, refurbishes homes and uh, commercial areas. And he actually had a, a challenge in meeting some of his customer requirements because some of his subcontractors, and especially those dealing with flooring and be able to provide the uh, flooring, uh, the employees did not want to go back to work uh, because there was a uh, period of time where all of the uh, business had to shut down. They did lay off uh, these employees for a short period of time. Uh, and then the, all of a sudden, the government came in with the various programs and the financial incentives uh, to help these employees that they are now unemployed. And he uh, discovered that uh, these employees, now that they have the demand, they want to be able to have them working again, rather not work because they're more financially incentivized not to work as compared to going back into their companies and working. Uh, and then, of course, they're still working, but they're working side jobs uh, under the table as well, so even garnering additional wages. And I do not uh, blame those individuals whatsoever. They're doing what's in the, their best interest and the best interest of their uh, families, uh, per se. But what I'm arguing is that I think sometimes when the government becomes involved, that they can uh, provide disincentives that exist. Now, I'm not saying all, all what the government has done is bad. Actually, I think organizations, government organizations such as the DOT have done a phenomenal job. And uh, Mr. Fishman, you're absolutely right. Things such as the hour of service were uh, loosened up uh, to some extent. Uh, but then I also sometimes think on the uh, converse as well. And I really uh, feel bad for especially the uh, the smaller uh, organizations, the mom and pops, that have had to make these significant financial investments 
improvements in technologies such as the ELD, the electronic logging devices, uh, for example, where the government actually monitors all the time uh, the work or you know the activities of that respective uh, truck driver. But so, uh, but other ones such as uh, I listened to a, a presentation yesterday from a MoDOT, Missouri Department of Transportation, and uh, one of the first things that they did was that they started to loosen up some of the uh, requirements uh, with regards to the weight loads uh, that exist. Uh, but then I also have to think about it. There's sometimes we still need a little bit of government involved, not too much, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, like I always think back to my army days when I was a uh, uh, tank platoon leader and then became a, a quartermaster, a supply officer, that we were always limited to some of the routes that we could take because if you're trying to put a 68 to 70 ton tank over some of those bridges, that's going to go right down into the uh, river uh, itself. So uh, overall, I think the government uh, has had some influence uh, within it, but I think I really would rather give more of the uh, credit to the companies and the supply chain professionals themselves for creating flexibility, adapting their production processes, adapting their uh, logistics processes, and especially with regards to the last mile of the supply chain. To me, these are the people and the organizations that have really truly added value and helping society in the long run. So, so that's a technical term. I'm familiar with it because uh, I did a lot of telecom work. But can you talk about what the last mile means? Because I think some. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. So uh, we're pretty darn good in our logistics and supply chains, and be able to get products from. Mother Earth, the raw materials to the various processors to OEMs, also known as the original equipment manufacturers, through the various wholesalers and uh, distributors, and eventually to the retailers. And so for many years, we've been so used to uh, you and I and everyone else, we'll walk, take our bicycle, drive to the respective retailer and be able to pro obtain those products that we need. That That is the last mile of the supply chain going from to the final delivery to the consumer themselves. Uh, we've seen a huge shift in this over the last uh, four or five years with Amazon, FedEx, UPS, being able to try to do that fulfillment. But the last mile is by far the most expensive part of the uh, supply chain and of the delivery of those products uh, to the consumers for really a myriad of reasons. Well, I think that's a perfect transition to bring in some of our other guests, uh, some of the guys who are driving that last mile. So I'm happy to welcome into the show first, uh, James Toller. James, in addition to being a libertarian candidate for Kentucky on 78th, is a over-the-road driver. And uh, James, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, as you said there, uh, first off, uh, I want to thank you for having me on tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Glad you're available. But, yeah, I am running for the uh, Kentucky uh, State House of Representatives in District 78 in the state of Kentucky. And I've uh, been driving a truck over the road now. Uh since 2012, I've seen uh, seen a lot of changes uh, come in, go out, uh, a lot of regulations more so coming in than going out. And everything since the COVID-19 uh, obviously has completely changed everything. Yeah, I, and that's uh, I appreciate that. We're going to talk about the more. Our other guest is uh, Aaron Ryan Smith. Uh, Aaron, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Fishman, for having me. My pleasure. And tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience in the trucking industry. Well, so I started driving truck in 2017. Uh, actually, thanks to my wife. It's something that I've always wanted to do, but uh, pretty much just came to my wife saying, well, why haven't you? So I went out and got my license, started driving. Um, I mean, it was... Not too much. I did a little bit of the owner operator. Um, unfortunately, I came into that at the wrong time because not only did I start in the winter time when freight's a little bit slower uh, on the consumable side, like the dry van refrigerated, um, but as soon as winter should have shifted into spring and the freight should have come back, that's when COVID decided to rear its head and drive rates even further down than they normally are in the winter. So I, and I unfortunately ended up having to, to go back to being a company driver. So that's a fascinating thing. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, James, you were talking about the fact that there are 
a lot fewer truckers on the road right now because of how much money uh, they're willing, they can get for, uh, for each mile on what's out there. Can you explain that a little bit for people who aren't familiar with how truckers get paid? Yeah, uh, truck drivers, we get paid by the mile. And, you know, a company, a company driver, and when I say company driver, that's a, just a driver that does not own a vehicle. You know, his truck, he's, he's driving for a company. Their, their pay really hasn't made them suffer for anything uh, as far as any kind of pay decrease or, or anything like that. Now, the owner-operator, your small business owner-operator, independent contractors out here that, that has their own trucks, you know, it, it takes about roughly, and it, and it varies from truck to truck and, and person to person, uh, but roughly about a dollar sixty cents a mile to operate your truck, and that's all the way down to maintenance to the tires, oil changes, uh, paying yourself, and things like that. And used to be, it wasn't hard to get three dollars a mile out here, running up and down the roads and delivering the products to the to the stores uh, from the shippers, and. Now, since COVID-19 has came in, it has just took a dramatic plunge. There, there's loads on the load board for us to get at 80 cents a mile uh, to $1.25 a mile. And, and, and remember, I said it takes $1.60 a mile to actually operate your truck. So they're, they're really wanting us to pretty much pay them to deliver their product and us really suffering the, the most part of it. Uh, that's fascinating. So, Aaron, you're saying you're a guy who moved from being an owner operator to going back to working for a company. Yes. How much? Uh, how easy is that? How easy is that transition? Like, was it? Did you have to spend a long time looking for a company, or was it easy to find a job? The beautiful thing is, in this industry, once you hit roughly a year of experience, um, you, a lot of stuff really opens up. A lot of companies really become available to you once you hit two years or three years you basically have your pick of the litter just because of how high the turnover rate is in the industry um so at companies everywhere are always looking for drivers oh, and that's interesting so i wonder uh dr zitizen if you could talk about how that uh liquidity in the market uh in terms of the labor market enhances our supply chain in the united states to me, I think this has been a, uh, another example of almost the Uberization of uh, processes that we have seen. So um, I think about with regard to the uh, taxi industry for uh, so many years, and then all of a sudden the Uber came with a, a different model. And my concern with this uh, model is that, and I think uh, Mr. Toller uh, brought this up uh, very, very uh, succinctly and very well, is that uh, I don't think many of these people truly understand what their cost structures are. You know, there's a tendency, I think, for uh, especially people that might not have as much uh, business acumen to just focus on what the direct costs are, what the fuel costs are, for example. Uh, but they don't start looking at really what the overhead rates are. And the overhead is what's going to really eat into you in the long term. You know, so it's the financing of the uh, truck, uh, for example, all of the uh, maintenance costs that uh, my uh, manifest uh, as well. So I think we've seen this uh, sh almost almost too quick of a shift to this Uberization or Uber model. And to me, you know, hearing the uh, stories out there, to me, it almost sounds like it's becoming more commoditized of a, a marketplace. And that uh, at some course, at some due course, that some of those that are taking these uh, jobs that are not paying as well, they're going to eventually fall out of the marketplace. My concern becomes is the uh, for people such as uh, Mr. Toller to be able to weather this uh, storm and to be able to ensure that uh, he's going to have enough of uh, cash flow, you know, as well as business uh, moving forward. Uh, but it's also, I think it depends upon in part the strategy that the, uh, especially the, some of the smaller companies uh, make uh, things such as can they differentiate their services, for example. Uh, so I don't know if that hopefully that answers or provides some insight. I think that's a very good answer and I appreciate it. So well, let's talk about the changes that we're seeing right now. Uh, James, how, and you know what guys, I'm going to put us all on a first name basis for the rest of the show. So please call me Dan, et cetera. Um, 
So, so James, <laughs> tell me how different uh, April 2020 is from April 2019 for you. It is. It, it, it's a huge difference. Um, as far as wondering and, and waking up every day and, and wondering what you're going to have to really do to be able to survive out here uh, with, with everything that has happened. And, you know, when you're at home, that's a different story. You know, we got, when you're at home, things are se seem to intend to be a lot cheaper, but you know, whenever you're, you're out here on the road and, and you're running all 48 States all over the country, you can only pretty much shop at truck stops and, and, and things like that. And, Stuff seem, team seems to be like twice as high at a truck stop as at Walmart. And so the biggest challenge is trying to figure out really every day what we're going to have to do and what we have to run every single day to be able to make a living, to be able to provide for our families. And, and that's that's the big challenge because what might be a dollar twenty five a mile to yesterday today may be 80 cents a mile, you know? So the challenge is just trying to be able to figure out and, and figure every morning, whenever you get up, what you really have to do to be able to make that living. That's a fascinating thing about it. And so let's talk uh, with Aaron about that a little bit too. Um, so, you know, the, the challenge is sort of making a living and obviously coming back yes. from having been an over operator to the company store. How different is it for you now from uh you know let's just say february uh well the the best way to put it is my wife and my dog had to be on the truck with me um because we couldn't really afford uh, we couldn't afford to keep a roof that kind of stuff so she kind of had to be on the road with me and we lived on that truck i think for six six months consecutively wow um and i mean right now we're this is actually my mother's house right now um well since i can finally get back up because uh, i just switched in april so uh we're working on getting everything back up but it's it's a lot easier for me now because it's consistent like like james was saying it's you have to worry about whether you can feed your family or where your next, where your next check's coming from, or if, if you can afford to take this load or that load. Um, whereas right now I just make a set amount for every mile I drive. So it, it makes it a little bit easier on me because my paychecks are a little bit more consistent. And then in that situation, you are driving essentially what the company tells you to pick up. You're doing only their loads. You don't Correct. have uh an opportunity. Now, one of the things that I've heard about, and uh, perhaps doctor's edition, you could talk about this a little bit, that one of the things that's happened is that in the disruption of the supply chain, especially with the Northeast being hit so much harder than everything else, that there's a lot of one-way runs going into the Northeast because there's nothing coming out. Have you heard anything about that or do you have any comments to that? No, I mean, I've heard that and that's, uh, you know, the back holes are always the, uh, in my opinion, the uh, critical part. The worst thing that you could ship is air. You know, that's, that's <laughs> by far the most expensive thing you could ever uh, ship itself. So, uh, and that's, I think, become uh, the issue with the uh, changing demand patterns uh, that we have seen. So that you're absolutely right. That has become a uh, challenge uh, that exists. And Eventually, it's going to get uh, self right back, but uh, you're absolutely right. That has been a, a challenge, and that's because we've seen such huge shifts in the uh, demand requirements. And James, is that something that you've noticed just in driving, that there are places that you're not going to anymore right now? Well, yeah, there is. I've, I've always been the type to uh, – I'm one of the drivers out here that after the first couple of years of driving, you know, and seeing everything – uh, that's whenever I set my point to say, I won't go into the Northeast. I won't go into, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, you know, and all that stuff. I don't do that anymore. Uh, because I guess, you know, like, uh, Aaron was saying, you know, that's, uh, you kind of earn that, you know, as you're out here so long. 
you know, to right. be able to say, you know, I don't want to go in the Northeast. But, yeah, it, it's been an issue for for a while, you know, going into the Northeast and really being able to find something out. And the same with not only the Northeast, but down in Florida. Uh, you know, it's it's been an issue in Florida forever to I get a lot down laughing. there coming out. <laughs> you know, if you do go to Florida, you know, you want to get – the best rate possible going into Florida. So, you know, you want to, you want to get three to $4 a mile if possible to go into Florida, because you're only going to get, if you're lucky right now, 80 cents a mile to come out of Florida. If you find anything. What, what is it about it? Florida doesn't make anything except for sunshine or. Well, they here lately, they ain't made a lot of that. It's been raining a lot down there. Uh, <laughs> But it's it, – Florida is about like Texas. Now, whenever you come out of Texas, you, you get some good loads coming out of Texas. But Florida and Texas are about the same way. A lot of stuff that ships within those two states ships literally within those two states. I you see. know, you, you might pick something up in uh, Tampa Bay and it'll go to Jacksonville or pick up something in Jacksonville and it'll go to Orlando where – or something like that. A lot of the stuff stays within the state and, you know, just to find anything coming out is it, it's, it, it, it's tough. And Dan, I, ahead, I think when we look yeah. at this, we have to actually look at it from really um, a multimodal perspective as well. So, uh, I mean, trucking is, you know, obviously uh, I kind of always considered it to be the uh, queen, the most flexible uh, form right. of transportation uh, that we have, but you also you have to understand how it competes with regard to other transportation forms, such as rail, such as the uh, waterways inland, as well as, you know, the ocean uh, carrying vessels. Uh, so there's certain products that are more attuned or more appropriate for certain transportation modes as compared to uh, other products as well. And as well as you have to also think about where are the various manufacturing uh, plants that we have. And part of it's been a really a tradition. You know, we think about, for example, a lot of the heavy manufacturing occurring in the uh, North Midwest, you know, in Michigan, for example, in Ohio. Uh, and so you have a lot of these large companies where you would end up having, you know, the uh, shipments that might come for the actual steel itself from Wisconsin, from uh, Minnesota, going through the uh, Great Lakes and then producing eventually the uh, cars, the uh, refrigerators and a lot of the more heavy manufacturing. And uh, you don't quite see quite as much of those types of products in a location such as Florida. So in part, I think it's uh, in partly dependent upon what the manufacturing base is for that respective region, uh, but you know, of course, uh, also, what are the other modes of transportation? And in the end, most things are really shipped uh, intermodally using at least two or more uh, modes of transportation. Right. What well, we talked about earlier, I mean, trucks are almost always the last mile. Uh, so, Aaron, let me ask you about that, uh, you know, as, as somebody who's, who's, I don't want to say a rookie, but you're the youngest uh, sure. tri truck driver that we have here. Have you been making trips to the Northeast recently? I live in Pennsylvania. All right. So, <laughs> so uh, not as ahead. many as I could, uh, but the company that I drive for is based in uh, central Pennsylvania. So they have a lot of Northeast runs. Interesting because I, so I, I lived in Boston for the last 25 years until I moved down here to the DC area. And so, you know, New Englanders and New Yorkers, we tend to think of ourselves as the center of the world. And so it's shocking <laughs> for me to hear that truck drivers don't want to come here because I would have thought, well, that's great, but it, it's actually not that. Now, let me ask you something about this. We talked earlier about uh, the uh, some of the, the regulations that the government has sort of pushed out of the way to try to address some of the things, such as uh, changing the... Uh, uh, so, Aaron, what are you holding up there? This is the Bible. This is <laughs> the trucker's Bible, the safety regulations. So if you think about it, a lot of most states when you go to take your driver's license, you have 40 to 60 pages roughly in, in the driver handbook. This book has 600 pages of regulation in small print. Mm. So, and, and that that's they, they, in order to get your CDL, you get tested on that. Uh, on a lot of it. Um, yep. But where I was kind of going with the, the regulations is 
any regulation that a government can just remove on a whim is it even worth being a regulation and so we they, we saw they removed the hours of driving yeah um what other things are you saying? What are the, what what's the most useless regulation that you guys see oh, right now? By, I'll by, give you each one. By far, the hours of service. It. Uh, I mean, if say say I can drive fifteen or sixteen hours, I get tired, but I only need six hours of sleep for yep. for a good night's sleep. Why can't I get up and drive? Why do I have to sit sit around twiddle my thumbs for four hours? You know, when I could be doing more work. That's a great example. Now, let me ask you this, and I'll, I'll take this one to James. How does the government know how long you've been driving? It's, uh, it's again, you know, the, the hours of service. I mean, uh, I know you all probably can't see it, uh, but this tablet right here yeah. uh, is called an e-log. And... Um, it was introduced as a as an electronic logging device, uh, ELD, mm-hmm. and that came about by the government pretty much slipping the ELD mandate within within another bill, which is called Map Twenty One, and that pretty much tracks every single thing that we do. Uh, you know, so we get pulled into a scale house, which is pretty much where the DOTs stage in, weigh your truck, pull you out back for an inspection if they want to, to check your truck and all that stuff. Well, if they pull you out back, you better make sure that them e-logs are yeah. good to go because a violation could cost you a lot of mm-hmm. money. So and, let me ask you first, I mean, it looks like, you know, uh, uh, it looks like a tablet, so I'm going to guess it's probably 50 bucks or so. Do you have to buy that yourself? Does the government provide it to you? Well, the, the, the big companies or the companies will, will provide you with the, with the tool necessary to, for your e-logs. Uh, unless you like lease purchase or something, then you, you have to pay for that over a period of time out of so much out of each check. And, but uh, the independent contractor, your small business owners, the people that, that truly own their trucks out here, they have to pay for that out of their own pocket. It's, it's not cheap. And I want to go back a little bit. You know, he, uh, Aaron was talking about the, uh, the hours of service. You know, that, that's the big regulation that we would like to see tossed out the window or, or deregulated a little bit or whatever. And President Trump said himself that we're not asking for a lot compared to what everybody else asks for whenever it comes to deregulation. We're really asking for a very small little bit. For instance, with the e-log, the only thing, I'm fine with driving 11 hours every day. I'm fine with that. But yeah. we've got 14 hours to drive that 11 hours. We're out here, we're racing the clock, making the roads unsafe because we got to make sure we get as much time in as possible so we can drive. The only thing, the one thing that they, oh, the only thing that they have to do with the e-logs is take away the 14-hour clock. If they would take away the 14 hour clock, we're golden. So I, I, you're going to have to explain that to me. I don't understand what you say. You have well, 14, 14 hours to drive 11. Got, right. Now, what our hours of service is, we've, we've got three different rules within our hours of service. We have a, uh, an 11 hour rule, a 14 hour rule, and a 70 hour rule. Now, the 11 and 14 work every day, hand in hand. You've got to make sure that you watch those two rules. And what that is, is from the time that I get up in the morning and we have to do a pre-trip on our truck uh, before we before we even take off every morning. So once we start our pre-trip, we have to go on duty for a pre-trip. Well, from the time that we go on duty, we have 14 hours from that point. And once we hit that 14 hour mark, our day is done. We've got to park. We've got to go to bed. They think we're tired. Government knows, you know, how we are out here. So, you know, they they tell us we got to go to bed. So within that 14 hours, we got 11 hours that we can drive. So, you know, if they would just take away the 14 hours and say, okay, now you got 24 hours to run 11 hours. It would just make it so much easier. And now when you say pre-trip, you have to like inspect the truck before you get on the road, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, you have to check, I mean, everything. It, 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 it's crazy of what all you really have to check to do a true pre-trip. 
uh, you know, currently has it as a hundred and two point inspection right. that we have to do every day on our truck. Right. You have to check 122 things on your truck and trailer. And, and then like, I mean, you have to fill out a form and that's one, some of the things that gets inspected on your e-log when you get to a yeah, stop. Or? It is. You have to do a pre-trip on that e-log and it, let's just say, for instance, let's say I start out right here where I'm sitting at right now and I do a pre-trip and I say everything is good. Yep. I hit it on there. I certify that everything is satisfactory, good to go, ready to run. I go 100 miles down the road, and they pull me out back for an inspection. If they find one thing wrong, I'm going to sit there until that's fixed, and I want to have I want to get a fine because I said on my inspection that everything was good. And, you know, it don't matter. It can happen within that 100 miles. Yep. You know, I, I know I know a driver that, I, that I've been talking to, and he literally – blew a tire about a hundred feet before he got to the, to the entrance of the scale house. He pulled into onto the scale house ramp and pulled off to the side of the road so he can get his tire fixed. The DOT officer came down and made him come up and go across the scales. When he got to the scales, he said, okay, driver, bring in your, go around back park, bring in your paperwork and all that. So he goes in gets a ticket for a blowing tire. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. so, Everything just gets us, you know, we make such little money to be such huge fines if something like that happens. I mean, it, it, it's really crazy. Well, and so now one of the other interesting things about this is we talk about, uh, you know, the owner operators are being hurt um, and, and that there are not as many of them driving right now. But uh, my understanding is that the government has bailed out the corporate truckers quite a bit, that they've gotten a lot of money and they're getting a, payroll assistance to keep drivers on uh, their drivers on the road. Uh, that, that sounds to me like an enormous advantage. Aaron, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, I've heard a lot about the subsidies recently. I haven't personally, honestly looked too much into it because if I'm being completely honest, as long as I'm getting paid, Sure. I mean, that, that's, well, that's first and foremost. Well, and that comes to an interesting thing. Dr. Zid is in, uh, Dr. Zedition can, uh, sorry, George, we're going on first name basis. <laughs> George, you can probably address this because Perfect. to a certain extent, the government does have a vested interest in making sure that there are some truck drivers so that the, that the market doesn't completely disappear. Oh, absolutely. And uh, we've seen this, I think, with uh, other industries uh, as well. It wasn't really very long ago that we saw this in the financial industry. Uh, we've seen this in the automotive industry where the government becomes involved and uh, starts to uh, put taxpayer monies uh, to try to keep these industries afloat. Uh, to me, though, I think in the long term, it provides some degree of disincentives uh, as well, uh, because then if these companies know that they always have this uh, safety net that is available, they may not necessarily make the best decisions uh, for their stakeholders, for their shareholders, uh, for their customers in the uh, long period of time uh, itself. They might not necessarily make those appropriate investments to assure that they have robust production processes, uh, that they have robust uh, supply chains themselves. Uh, to me, whenever I think about the government becoming involved, someone's paying. You know, right. there is nothing for free in the world. And so we're going to pay for this. You know, when we had this first stimulus check that uh, came out, uh, all the monies are being spent on the different companies themselves. I think in the long term, it provides a, a disincentive and really hurts us overall. If a company is not able to perform, they're not able to have a robust business model and process, they're not going to be uh, competitive anymore. And to me, it almost kind of, it hurts me. It hurts my heart to see that uh, we sometimes put investments in companies when it's not necessarily warranted. It's not necessarily for national security or for other reasons itself. Uh, so most of those times I see those uh, incentives, I think it's a disincentive uh, for uh, productivity in the long term. It's a disincentive for productivity, but also for innovation, you know, one of the, yeah. the things that uh, libertarians talk about is, uh, you know, there's, I, I quote this a lot for LPTV fans, uh, in Hayek's last book, The Fatal Conceit, he talks about, you know, this miraculous world that we live in. And we can certainly talk of the supply chain as being part of that. And that comes on the back of a thousand failures and one success, and then a thousand failures and one success. When the government interferes in the trucking market, it actually 
prevents innovations from happening. And I mean, I, I, I'm willing to bet that I could find any trucker who could come up with an, an innovation. They think if we could do this right now, we'd be making a lot more money, okay. but we can't because of this, that, and the other thing. So, Dan, oh, I'm sorry. no, no, please go ahead. Oh, no, no. They, I think they really go a hand in glove uh, together. So, so you have to be able to innovate and continuously improve to be able to have better uh, processes, either distribution processes, different production processes. You could be the best uh, typist uh, in the world typing a typewriter, but that don't mean a hill of beans compared to the technologies that make things so much uh, quicker today. You know, a hundred years ago, it was the uh, horses. Uh, well, maybe 120 years ago that were yeah. pulling the wagons. And so it continually improves. And if very often uh, government will curb the innovation and the innovation facilitates the productivity. Uh, that's a great way to look at it. So let me come back to, uh, to you, Aaron, talk a little bit more about uh, sort of how the job has changed. You know, one of the things that I have uh, a couple other friends who are, uh, they drive local, but they talk about the fact that the community has really seemed to shift it a lot. And like the truck stops that they would go to, there's not as many people there right now. And that the absence is really sort of telling. Have you seen some of, have you seen any of that? I'm still seeing a lot of truck stops or at, at least the, the major chains that a lot of the corporate companies go to as still filling up every night by five or six o'clock at night. Um, the mom and pops are, are definitely dwindling down, which is usually where the owner operators stop um, yeah. because they're more out of the way. They, they don't have to worry about just having a whole cluster. There might only be 20 or 30 spots. Um, those ones are usually pretty empty, but <clears throat> uh, actually I kind of wanted to touch on, um, on what George said Please. Uh, about technology. Uh, so what I'm noticing is technology is only, beneficial to the trucker if uh if the government implements it like the electronic logs um just this year i think january of this year they implemented a central clearing house for a drug and alcohol consortium so now instead of just basically being within the company now you know should you fail a drug test or refuse a drug test or whatever um Hopefully nobody would in this industry, but now it's, <laughs> it's all put into this central government database that they've created through the FMCSA and DOT that now, you know, if, if I was to fail or refuse a drug test right now, but I want to go to XYZ company here, then they, they don't even have to ask me or they don't even have to drug test me. They can just click a couple of buttons and see my entire history through that. Interesting. I, I have to tell one of my favorite yeah. stories. Uh, I, I was working I, right out of college. I took a, an offer from company. Uh, and then two days later, I got a much better offer. And I'm like, how am I going to get out of this, this first offer they came? And the first company came back to me and they said, Oh, oh, by the way, we need you to take a drug test. And I said, no problem. I know everything about drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so that was how I got out I of it. <laughs> it. It got me out of the job. <laughs> but so that leads me to an interesting question. I'm guessing that your drug standards are federal and not state. So even if you were driving in states that, uh, you know, you could legally purchase cannabis in yep. and, and potentially recreationally consume, it doesn't matter if a week later, you test positive? Correct. And um, that's for everything, cannabis? Yeah, they. Uh, I mean, different companies can choose to test for different things. Some will do the, I, I, I think they're like a five stage and a nine stage or something like that, or five drug and nine drug or something like that. Um, they can choose what they want to test for. Um, but, I mean, if you think about it, alcohol is legal nationwide. Yeah. Uh, but our DUI limit is actually half of that of, of a personal car. Our, really? our DUI limit is 0. 0.4. 0. 0. 4. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. So <laughs> let me ask you a little bit, J James, and too. sort of, if we're talking about sort of the intrusion into your sort of personal life uh, as a trucker, uh, we, we talked on sort of drugs and, and hours and stuff like that. 
Are there other regulations that the government does in terms of you as a person that seem uh, unreasonable or things that, you know, might make it uh, easier for more people to, to enter the market? Yeah, I mean, it, it's getting real. I, I, I'm glad you asked, Kevin, because I've been sitting here thinking about one certain thing all the way all right. through. It's like, well, he might get to something. He might not here. Let's see. Uh, but, yeah, uh, it, it's getting to where it's getting very easy to get into the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bad thing about that, I, I if people want to drive a truck, I'm all for it. Yep. I'll help them out in any way possible. You know, the only thing they have to do is that pick up the phone, give me a call. I put my phone number out there publicly all the time in live videos on truck driving groups. And the thing, the reason we harp on things and the regulation that really gets me is the safety of the training, mm -hmm. the training regulations, uh, because the training regulations out here for a new student, Let's just take uh, for you, uh, for instance, Mr. Hinchman. Um, it's if you just come straight into the industry, you don't yeah. have your CDL. You know, you go to a truck driving school. You're in truck driving school for two weeks. The only thing truck driving school does is teaches you how to get your CDL. OK. And then after you get your CDL, you get on a trainer's truck. <clears throat> now, remind remind you here that you've never been behind the wheel of a truck. Right now they're, they're pushing their students through and off their trainers trucks within three weeks mm. because they want them out there. Why do they want them out there? Because the company wants to make money off of them, obviously. But is that really safe? No, it's not. You know, they need a lot of time behind the wheel because when it comes, for instance, uh, as Aaron was talking about winter time while ago. You know, if you if you're in inside your trainer's truck and you're you're getting trained as a as a CDL holder operator, and you drive that three weeks in July, well, whenever it comes to snow, you don't know how to control that truck. Yeah. You know, and and you may be on your trainer's truck just only in the Midwest. You know, you go out west where the big mountains are at. You know, do mountain driving, but what are you going to do? You have no idea because you've never been on a mountain. Right. And, and it's going to get worse. They've, they've came out with a new, the new training standard, which they pushed back a little bit. It's supposed to be in the 2020 training standard. And they pushed it back a little, but it's still out there on the table to come out, which means you can get your CDL with zero hours behind the wheel. Yep. Wow. Uh, you know, and the training standards pretty much been, you know, went from probably when this comes out goes from three weeks to maybe a week in the, in the trainer's truck. You know, why are they doing that? Push more people out there. The government is given the artificial and information and trying to make everybody believe that there's a truck driver shortage out here. So they want to try to push these students through there to make, try to make it look like that they're doing their job to make sure the supply chain don't stop and they're getting more drivers in. Right. So that's, that, you know, the safety aspect of it, I, that's my biggest thing out here. You know, we, us as truck drivers, Aaron, myself, and everybody else, we're not out here to hurt anyone. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, that's not what we're out here for. Now, a lot of people have that, that vision that that's what we're out here for and that we don't care. You know, I'll hit the ditch and I'll turn my truck over before I hit a car and try and, and possibly kill somebody. Sure. You know. But the new drivers with the new training standard, they're not going to do that because they're not going to know what to do. They're not going to, not, you know, and they're just going to go and they're going to plow right into that car and they're going to kill somebody. You know, that's what? not what we want. Sure. And that, you know, that leads us to a fascinating point. We're coming up into our, our last 10 minutes. I want to go back to George a little bit and talk about, uh, you know, some of the things that are coming down uh, in terms of, uh, you know, as we're looking at, you know, what might be a prolonged uh, shutdown of the country. And there's a lot of people talking about the fact, uh, you know, James talked about the difference in driving in the snow. Uh, and if we were to have a second, uh, a second surge in the virus in the winter, people are saying winter is going to be a lot different than the spring was. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about some of the differences in the supply chain in bad weather, especially, you know, in the North of the country in the snow and how, you think that might impact us? 
Well, uh, with the weather, there's always going to be uh, uncertainty uh, that exists. And so you're absolutely right in certain parts of the uh, country that you end up having more of the, uh, what I would call the mi minor disruptions uh, that can occur. Uh, but I think overall, I think a lot of the companies, uh, so I'm looking at this from a firm perspective, a sure. corporation uh, perspective, that they've actually been going through the learning stages of how to be able to manage and uh, deal with a, a pandemic with given their respective resources that they have. So I think that they actually will be able to uh, still be able to provide those uh, products and services uh, that we uh, need because they've already gone through this learning curve uh, to uh, some extent. Now, of course, the conditions do change, but I look at Aaron and uh, James, they've been driving in snow. I've been, I'm sure they've been driving in really cruddy conditions throughout uh, their lives uh, and they know what they're doing in those uh, processes. Uh, supply chains can't stop. So there was be finding ways of being able to provide those uh, products. And you have to also remember it's uh, when we think about supply chains and, and here we're only looking at one part of this, the transportation modes uh, that we have. Supply chains deals with warehousing. It deals with uh, many other production processes themselves. So we're looking at the transportation. There's other modes of transportation that have more of that resiliency. I always think about pipeline, for example. That's one right. of the uh, transportation modes. That's not going to be affected uh, so much itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I've seen other supply chains that have been affected that we have not discussed. So, for example, um, working in uh, Missouri, you know, St. Louis is a critical intermodal location where you have a lot of barge traffic uh, that occurs. So the inland waterways with the Mississippi River and the confluence with the uh, Missouri uh, yep. River. They've been dealing with issues with uh, floods or low water levels for uh, many years. But I think of the challenges and now you have to be able to coordinate different state legislations at different uh, times. So you're trying to coordinate these laws when you're going down the Mississippi, you're going through five, six, seven different states. You know, a lot of those employees have not been able to even leave the barge. And can you imagine spending seven, eight days on one of those small barges, uh, yeah. not being able to uh, to get off? So I think uh, a lot of the companies actually have uh, gone through some of the learning lessons uh, already. So I'm going to be optimistic. Uh, do, do you think forward, as long any, as the government stays out? Do you think there'll be any supply problems uh, come the winter? I mean, are we more susceptible to? Uh, I mean, obviously, fruits and vegetables we don't grow as much in the. Uh, in the winter months. Do you think that that's a potential issue if uh, we're still in the middle of the plague? Uh, I've seen more of a substitution uh, itself. So you might not have all of the variety of the fruits or the uh, vegetables, uh, but where I've been seeing actually more of the uh, new research coming out is really focusing on how you're going to, if a vaccine is developed, how are you going to be able to uh, create an appropriate distribution strategy to be able to get that out to uh, basically 300 million people here in the United States. And we look at it from a global perspective, billions of people. So I think that's going to be one of the uh, big issues of how you're going to be able to ramp demand up for something like that and then be able to distribute it in a uh, equitable and efficient manner. Oh, that's, that's a really great quote. I hadn't even thought about that. Uh, so Aaron, let me come to you with a last question. Uh, so yeah, I heard you say you're staying at your mother's house, your mother-in-law's house. Yeah. No, my where, mother's, house. Where, mother's house. Where's where's the next run to? Do you know yet? I honestly don't. They usually don't give it to me until a day or two before, and gotcha. I believe that Sunday or Monday morning. Where would you want to go to right now if you're going to pick up a road? Oh, uh, actually, I love going to the Upper Northeast, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine. Uh, I don't like the interior Northeast where all the cities are, and yep. it's a little too hot to be going down south. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very reasonable. All right, I'm going to come back to uh, to James. Uh, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, James, to get. I, I see you're uh, adjusting the camera, but uh, talk a little bit before I sign off, people. Uh, this is uh, LPTV. We're on the air every Thursday night. Uh, we do uh, Libertarian Party Town Hall, where we talk about libertarian issues and the way they face the country. Uh, tomorrow night is uh, Candidates Corner with Pat Ford, and Pat will have on. Uh, uh, Ted Brown, who's running in Texas, and um, and I can't remember the other candidate uh, running for governor in North Carolina. 
Uh, but uh, definitely tune in tomorrow night at eight o'clock. Uh, and let's see. Hey, James, can you tell us uh, what's a good, tell us a little bit about your congressional race or your uh, yeah. state house race? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, James. Okay. Because my, my headset kind of looks like your camera's acting up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, now I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Now I can. Yeah, just okay. hold it close to your face. It's all right. Okay, yeah. Uh, again, I'm running for the uh, State House of Representatives in the state of Kentucky in the 78th District. Uh, Campaign is going great, uh, you know, with this COVID-19 and everything that, that has came up. Uh, it kind of put a uh, kind of put a wrench into everything uh, as far as going out, knocking on doors and everything. Uh, but we have everything set up now to actually get out there and start knocking on doors, talking to the constituents and seeing what their concerns really are. And, uh, you know, we're all really excited about that. We've got a great campaign team uh, that's that's really gotten me through a lot of stuff. You know, I, I'm new to politics. So, you know, having a great campaign team is really the key to a lot of things. And I'm really blessed with who I have on my campaign team. Everything's going great. I think we're going to have a, low, a lot of momentum going into November the 3rd and the, into the general election. And, you know, who knows, maybe – Maybe the Libertarian Party could start winning some some races. I'd love to see that. You you guys have a great state party there. Uh, your chair, Chris Wiest and uh, Christy Kendrick and Ken Molman. Uh, I'm just astounded at how good your party is in Kentucky. So certainly wish you success. And I, I want to thank all my guests again. I'm going to go back to formal names. Uh, Doctor's Edition. Uh, I think people who are interested more in the supply chain, check out his, uh, check him out on Amazon. A lot of books out there. Uh, Aaron Ryan Smith, who's uh, driving and uh, making sure that uh, some of the stuff that you want to see in the store is going to be there. And James Toller, who, in addition to being over the road guy, is also running for office in Kentucky. So thank you guys very much. Thanks to our audience. This is LPTV, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan.